Welcome to the second session in our Digital Transformation and Financial Inclusion Conference. In this section, we will talk a bit more about digital transformation and compliance and how these two notions are interconnected, which influences which more uh, high level of compliance or how the um, high amount of compliance rules contributes to uh, a good digital transformation of the other way around. Does digital transformation contribute to the fact that the compliance level or requests related to compliance become uh, maybe less strict? In this section, I would like to introduce first of all the person that will moderate the work of this panel, uh, Elena Stobun, who has over 22 years of activity in the financial sector, in FinCom Bank, out of them, eight years in the management bodies of, if I'm not mistaken, in the same bank. And currently she is uh, the director of uh, the development department within FinCom Bank. Hello, Elena. Hello, Veronica, and thank you for this challenge. I am very glad to moderate this panel. It's a very practical and interactive one. I will encourage you, let's be active. Let's ask questions and just exchange experience and practice with our speakers who have a rich background and knowledge, both theoretical and practical. Let's try to exchange information and get value added from our communication. I would like to tell you that digital transforma transformation changes companies in various sectors. They improve quality of customer service, marketing and sales, research, uh, logistic chains, and so on. All of that is done from the perspective of keeping up with the competition in order to increase and keep uh, revenues, optimize expenses. But also lately, another very important topic is, the top, is compliance. Compliance of a company in various fields, various to, to compliance with various um, regulatory uh, requirements. Of course, these changes, um, operational models of the bank itself, growth factor, it's an engine of moving, and this digital revolution will keep growing bigger. We will not be as we were yesterday or the way before, or the day before yesterday. No, previously, uh, it, we used to consider the digital transformation mostly related to clients, online solutions. Today, we actually understand the digital transformation is actively becoming a part of back office processes in the bank, in the companies. They optimize, it optimizes them, it transforms them for the company to become effective in terms of expenses and compliance. Which means digital transformation for the company is not what we want or we don't want to do, but the market makes us do. This is the must have that we should have started doing in the past. During our panel, we will discuss uh, interesting topics. You know, in the previous panels, we discussed the front and the client, everything related to um, clients, conservative compliance and risks and all of that pulls the company back. But still, compliance risks are very important in the activity of every company because at any stage, it can just stop their work. If all investment all is uh, at some point, they can bring no return only because of not uh, and it's not related to risks, but because of non-compliance in a field or another. So today we digitize many data, uh, many processes, and we need to understand how can we uh, guarantee the safety of this information, uh, guarantee the access of right people at right time to this data. How can we make sure that we have no data leaks and uh, protect from uh, both internally and from cyber hackers that are actively trying to find uh, weaknesses in our information security. We are working with client data. We save a lot of personal data of clients. We uh, store employees data. We process data, suggesting a solution or another. How do we do it the right way? How do we ensure uh, the lack of unsanctioned, unenforced access to data? How can we do things to make sure that data is stored in the right place at the right time, they are processed correctly? 
and at uh, and can ensure the right uh, disposal when our business relation is over. And clients are different, and the transactions with clients are very diversified. How do we understand if this client is doing what they should do, or are there some operations that are raising concerns because tens and uh, hundreds of thousands of operations cannot check by eye. You can you cannot ensure that by the staff that works in the field of AML prevention. So we need to in integrate digital technology here that allows us to be effective in this respect and allow uh, the regulatory risks that may happen and again to add more security to our business today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And you know, it's very interesting for me and it's close to me from business point of view. Um, how do we onboard clients? How a a person becomes a client from a potential client. We are used to situations when clients come to our office, to our point of sale, and we onboard them according to the process that we know. But around us, uh, regions move to EKYC. It's digital know your client, digital onboarding. What solutions are available in this respect? How should we prepare to changes in the law that we have uh, heard in the first panel uh, of the conference? Therefore, in uh, our panel, we will discuss about cybersecurity of payments, of financial architecture, cybersecurity of, um, of cryptocurrencies, and what r rules and what risks we have in the field of uh, uh, combating AML and counter terrorist financing. What, what IT solutions exist in this respect, how to, um, um, to avoid that such laws go through our company and what are the best practices in our region and we'll talk about ekyc about onboarding and also we'll talk about challenges uh, that national companies have in the field of personal data protection i'm very glad to introduce our first speaker natalia natalia uh, is new payment platform director in mastercard ukraine and moldova we know natalia for many years now Natalia was the one the root of implementing an idea of ours, with, which we turned from an idea into practice. She was a member of that team. And Natalia, I'm very glad to welcome you at this conference and I give you a floor. Thank you very much, Elena. I'm so glad to see you. I don't know if you can hear me. Let's check the sound. Yes. So. And really, I'm so happy to be here today. You cannot imagine that a ray of light in our current circumstances and situation. And uh, yes, I represent today MasterCard company and this uh, payment system company. And uh, in, in my current role, I'm working for uh, the team, which we call new payment platforms. And what does it mean actually for, not, for us? Uh, I will be talking about that. And uh, I, we were thinking what to talk about today, and we decided to choose quite provocative topic. And that is how we call it crypto, but what we understand on the, uh, behind the crypto. So let's let's try to, to, to clarify that, because uh, in our standard world, in our standard universe in MasterCard, who we are, we are about payments, right? And MasterCard is a network, is a, a payment network which connects um, thousands of financial organizations. We connect uh, millions of merchants. We connect billions of card holders. And if you are paying with your card, with MasterCard logo, probably it's happening just because of us, because we are helping our financial institutions, our customers, our banks to do those payments. But that is, uh, let's say, obvious payment flow for us. That is obvious world, obvious universe. We know how it works, right? And uh, in crypto world, that is something different. That is uh, something which not about payment. That's something new, provocative, innovative, digital. And uh, that's why uh, we are looking for the ways, right? How to connect both worlds, how to bring this beautiful friendship and actually what MasterCard can do. On payment side, what we are doing, just imagine, just imagine your transaction, how you are doing your payment uh, and what MasterCard 
uh, gives to our customers, our banks in regards of cybersecurity. Uh, on each step, on each step, even before uh, transaction is happening, we have tools and we provide scoring, we provide uh, level of the risk to our customers, if it's secure transaction or not, if it's secure authentication, uh, identification for this particular payment. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we have a tools to help our banks to make a decision on each payment how risky this is, how fraudulent this is, or not, or maybe not. And uh, looking at crypto world, so have you, I don't know, have you ever thought what crypto means for you? Is it just a long-term, uh, probably money-saving mechanism, or that speculation? I believe, uh, I believe everybody can answer this question on their own. But looking at numbers and what is happening now with this crypto world and what we have, uh, I would say that capitalization of crypto world is almost equal of the, to the GDP of quite decent big country, right? So it is already happening. People are already using that. Uh, in many countries, we know based on our estimation up to 30, 35% of people are already with crypto, but with which crypto, right? Uh, we know that there are many different cryptocurrencies. Uh, are we talking about stable or uh, 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 currencies like Bitcoins or uh, Ethereum with a huge, huge, big volatility? Or are we talking about maybe central bank digital currencies? We as MasterCard, yes, we, we had a partnership in many countries in central, with central banks uh, on several projects with this uh, digital currencies for central banks. But uh, the world of crypto, the world of crypto uh, currencies with huge volatility, uh, bringing us really huge risk, right? So, and we need to think how to address those risks in terms of uh, IML, KYC. Uh, I've heard today during the day, people were talking about that, right? So it is really bringing importance and uh, as the business is already so big, we have to address it. And we as MasterCard, as we position ourselves as an innovative a digital company, and that's why we just cannot uh, avoid this, what's happening there. So uh, the idea uh, is to combine, to connect those two worlds, but how? Actually, what you can do with crypto? And by the way, my favorite joke, you know, uh, if I want to make $1 million, right, how much I need to invest to crypto? And the answer is $2 million. And that job just really, once again, showing uh, the risk, ML risk for this really big piece of and big pie, which everybody is trying to eat. So, and from MasterCard side, what actually we can do with crypto? What Natalia? we can offer? Yes, I'm with Natalia. you. Natalia, uh, Natalia, scusi. Sorry, Natalia. I am afraid we don't see a presentation. Do you have a presentation, actually? Just to make sure, do you have a do do you have a presentation to share? Because we don't see it. Could you please share it with us so that we can make sure that we see because. We know you prepared a presentation and we want to make sure that everyone can have access to it. Really sorry, but unfortunately I cannot speak Romanian, so can you hear me? Can you see me? Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Hi, um, Natalia, sorry, we are not here. We cannot see your presentation. It seems that you, you haven't uh, shown it with us. We know that you have one. That would be very nice if you can share it with us as well. Perfect. Now we can see. Thank you. That's, uh, you know, in any digital world, we are always facing these digital issues. So, and the question, if we can solve it quickly, so that's always, yeah, sometimes it is happening. So coming back to, to, to the topic and uh, to the presentation, uh, what actually, we as MasterCard can offer and uh, do and can offer to the markets and uh, what we can do with crypto. 
uh, what you can do, we can buy crypto. As card holders, as people, we can buy crypto, we can sell crypto, but we were thinking how to connect those worlds, payment and crypto. And that's, that's why we are launching our crypto card program, which means uh, we, we will, uh, based on certain strict principles, we will give possibilities to banks and to card holders and to the crypto users, those who have already balance with crypto, to use their balance in all all uh, environment, acceptance environment, which MasterCard has. In simple words, we are saying that uh, we are partnering with the banks who are issuing MasterCard card, and this card will be connected to existing crypto balance of the cardholder. And cardholder will be able to pay with this crypto balance in uh, any accepted location which MasterCard has, which MasterCard uh, can offer to card holders, so everywhere a card holder can pay. And of course, now we are coming to strict requirements because that's high risk business. And uh, that's why our program is supposed to have strict rules. Here we are talking about IMA requirements, KYC requirements, and of course, due diligence of the partner which bank can bring to this program. Uh, but thinking further, also with MasterCard, we will be able to help uh, our banks and customers with a product which we call Cypher Trace. And uh, that's really unique based on our understanding, it's really unique product which can measure the risk of a crypto exchanger partner, which can measure the risk of those crypto transactions, crypto transfers. It can really help to the banks to support the IMI requirements uh, with uh, this crypto card program implementation and uh, offering to the card holders. So uh, I believe uh, as a summary, uh, Everybody has his, its own, his own opinion on crypto, right? For me personally, that's quite risky and I'm, I'm playing with the crypto already for five years. For me, that's the game. For someone, it can be really investment. But what I'm absolutely sure that with everything which is happening now with crypto, with all the hype, uh, it will be crystallized very soon in someone something really what, uh, what market needs, and it will be somehow regulated and will be, uh, will be, uh, we will remove it from gray zone, let's say, right? So I uh, really pass my word to other speakers and thank you very much. We'll be happy to participate in any discussion and answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. We will have a Q&A session at the end. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Adrian. Adrian is the deputy director of um, the AML service. Adrian, please, the floor is yours. Hello. I am very glad to have the opportunity to attend this event. And I hope that we will manage to clarify as many questions as possible because we always have this feeling that Preventing and fighting money laundering is somehow a uh, business back. But uh, actually, we had many cases when, thanks to the efforts we made, we fostered the development of businesses. Because uh, when we were evaluated in 2019 by the money wall, there was a high risk for Moldova to be included on the gray list. And if it happened, then it would have pushed back the Moldovan economy significantly. And this would have had uh, a significant impact on businesses. It would have decreased the external support. Uh, the transfer would last uh, not two days, but two weeks. So my point is that preventing and fighting money laundering is helping the society rather than damaging it. It is very important for us to understand the measures that should be taken in order to improve things in the sector and within the entity. That is why my presentation today will focus on a process which is called AML 
risk assessment. Actually, this is a process that took place for the first time in 2015 to 2015, 2017, according to the World Bank methodology. In 2017, an action plan was developed to implement measures to address the risks identified back then. After Money World Committee of the Council of Europe assessed the Republic of Moldova, we were obliged to take certain measures in order to overcome the deficiencies identified. And if we if we were to speak about the international standards, especially the first recommendation of FATF, which says that the country should assess risks, so we had to update the risk assessment. We have recently finished this update. The report was submitted last uh, months. The process was delayed because of the pandemic, but with all of the difficulties, uh, and in spite of these difficulties, we have managed to produce this assessment, which actually aims at uh, establishing the risk areas. And uh, the risk here is divided into broad sections threats and vulnerabilities. The threats are the crimes generating illegal revenues that can be potentially laundered. And here five such uh, threats were identified at the national level. They are, they have remained unchanged uh, compared to the first assessment with a minor exception. At the first assessment, we had corruption, tax evasion, trafficking and drugs, trafficking in people, and uh, smuggling. After the update, we found that it is more relevant to or one of the threats identified by the working group are the cyber frauds to the detriment of trafficking in human beings. Because uh, this is already a feature or obvious feature of the assessed uh, period. And because of the pandemic period, we have a quick shift to using uh, various software and application. A lot of activities were moved uh, online. So we had many fraud, uh, several frauds, including some uh, well-known cases of when uh, credit card holders were defrauded. Uh, maybe you've heard, maybe some of your relatives uh, were affected. I personally have uh, relatives that were affected by this fraud. And because of that, uh, this digitalization or this uh, shift into online environment of many activities poses certain risks. That is why it is important for us to adjust our um, activities in line with the risks identified. So the evaluation report developed by the authorities because our service coordinated the efforts, but all authorities participated, including law enforcement bodies. So this is a national exercise that uh, engages many authorities and is a massive uh, effort made by the whole government. All of the sectors that were evaluated were scored a risk level. And this risk level is intended to guide the sectors and reporting uh, entities with regards to the measures that they have to implement. And in my presentation, I will describe partially these sectors and the indicators that are relevant. The sectors refer mainly to vulnerabilities, because as I've said, threats are um, a crime uh, generating uh, illegal or potential with a potential to generate illegal uh, revenue. But the vulnerabilities are the gaps in the system. So we will present uh, the gaps identified by the working group so that we have clarity with regards to the legal framework. We have law number 308 on preventing and fighting money laundering, which entered into force uh, on February 2018. And it stipulates all of the actions that have to be taken by authorities in the ML area. 
So Article 6 of that law establishes that the surveys, reporting entities, relevant authorities shall assess risks. And this is what happened. The service coordinated this process and together with all of the responsible authorities in order to implement the manual recommendations, to implement the strategy that is approved by the parliament's decision. We So the strategy is national strategy five-year period and the key uh, uh, elements of the strategy is to perform the risk assessment after the risk assessment was done we had uh, sorry let me find the right slide so after that we had the possibility to establish the risk level for each sector reviewed so if you want if you would like to find out more details about the conclusions or findings of the report you can find it on the website of our service so we have sent it to the community after uh, the meeting we had but uh, we did not see there this uh, nice looking table so the report uh, it's very detailed, but one needs a lot of time to understand it, to read it and understand it. That's why I believe that this way of presenting the results is easier to understand. And I believe that uh, it will be useful, including uh, for professional trainings for the reporting entities. But the most important thing is that the National Risk Assessment uh, Report is the basis for sector uh, reports because we have already informed the supervisory authority about the need to perform a sector risk assessment. For example, the National Bank is supervising three areas, banking uh, institutions, payment service providers and exchange offices, and they need to make a um, sector risk assessment because the national assessment uh, presents a general perspective, whereas the um, sectoral assessment should go into more details into that specific sector. After that, the reporting uh, entities on the basis of the national risk assessment report and sector risk assessment report to develop their own risk assessment. And this assessment done by reporting entities is the basis of all AML actions. What does it mean? It means that the reporting entities establishes by its own what is the acceptable risk level. In other words, what operations or services provided. Uh, uh, so they, they establish the risk level for the services and operations conducted. So if uh, the risk level is low, then the measures are simplified. Conversely, if the risk level is high, then the measures implemented, the precautionary measures are much more complex and this risk assessment should uh, list what risk mitigation activities should be carried out by the reporting entity because if there is a client that has a history of 20 years and they does not differ it has not changed over the past 20 years of course, the reporting entity should not waste a lot of time to assess that uh, client on a daily basis or uh, frequently, and vice versa. If they do not meet with the, uh, they, they're not aligned uh, with the ordinary activity of the client, or if something new appears in their activity behavior, then they need to implement enhanced due diligence measures. Uh, they need to make a more detailed, a more comprehensive evaluation. So this risk assessment is a kind of guideline for the reporting entities with regards to the measures to be taken. We have requested that supervisory authorities perform a sector risk assessment, the results of which should be communicated to reporting entities so that they can carry out the risk assessment at their level. Here you can see the risk levels. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, um, medium to high risk is characteristic of sectors that are either connected to cash 
or were identified by the working group as having certain gaps or vulnerabilities. And we have a sector with a, a high level of risk. These are virtual assets. We have already discussed about it. This is crypto money. So in the CATF recommendation, they are defined as virtual assets. They are not regulated by the law of Moldova, which means that the risk is high because we do not have any capacity to intervene or to implement uh, certain measures. On the other hand, it does not mean that uh, we do not have a capacity to investigate. If you have the opportunity, you can check the annual report of our service published on our website. And there we have information about a scheme using virtual assets. And as a result of that investigation, a criminal case was started. So it means that the existing reporting entities, if the transaction use virtual assets, the service has the capacity by international cooperation using open source intelligence uh, tools to investigate and to establish whether these assets are connected to crimes or other unlawful activities, including activities performed outside of the Republic of Moldova. That is why the virtual assets were included as high risk activities. Now we have to amend accordingly the legal framework to stipulate the measures to be taken. And I believe that when we do the next update of the national assessment, the level can be reviewed. But again, it depends on the capacity of the authorities, engagement of the reporting entities, and many, many other factors that are taken into account when the risk level is established. Regarding the banking sector, almost all of the groups that have developed this risk assessment were led by the supervisory authorities in charge of certain areas. Obviously, um, the banking sector was the responsibility of the National Bank. The National Bank identified a series of uh, risks. They are a reflection of the actions taken by the supervisory authority what they have established as part of their control measures and subsequently this working group identified a series of vulnerabilities um, that were presented you can see them here they referred to measures that were taken or the a shortage insufficiency of these measures and um, they are uh, related to the activity of the reporting entity from the AML perspective. So the supervisor uh, performed a kind of general audit where all of us together, working group members, have the possibility to identify these gaps, these drawbacks. I will not uh, read them because I would prefer to have a discussion. I don't want to read the information from the slide especially that this um, uh, information is available on our website. If you would like to have more details, you can find the report on our website. And there you can see two big sections, uh, uh, threats and vulnerabilities. And uh, the vulnerabilities are divided by sectors. So we have a detailed analysis for each sector. So uh, uh, for you to understand the structure of the report, because the report is lengthy, but the structure is not complicated at all. If you are interested in one sector only, then it will be very easy for you to find the needed information. And uh, if you'd like to formulate certain conclusions or to reassess your risks, that report will be useful as well. But I recommend for you to do this. Well, you can do it now, of course, but uh, you should also take into account that a sector risk assessment will be conducted as well. Banking sector and insurances. 
So the insurance sector uh, I don't know what is happening with the slides. I'm moving too quickly. Okay, so that's the right slide. The insurance sector, again, uh, this group was led uh, by the National Commission for Financial Market, considering their mandate. And again, here we have reflected uh, the um, deficiencies or gaps identified as a result of the um, auditing of the insurance firms. So uh, um, these gaps were identified or were established on the basis of the audit findings. So you can see that these are kind of general provisions, such as non-uniform KYC rules, but they are deriving from the auditing activity or inspection activity. And uh, in a, a certain company, this was identified as a trend. Uh, they have not applied uh, the KYC principle for a number of um, customers. That's why this was um, listed as a gap. Uh, economy and loan association. The risks are not that high because the products they offer are not so much prone to money laundering. I don't think we have ever identified a money laundering scheme or certain risks related to economy and saving associations. So again, here we have a list of the gaps identified by the working group, but the overall risk level is not high. Non-banking payment service providers. These are the types of entities that have started to be used massively. They are providing they have exceeded the banking sector the number of reported transactions. So from we are reporting transactions are the amounts are low So this is a first uh, uh, signal for us because on the one hand uh, 
uh, they uh, submit a lot of reports. But on the other hand, we understand that the digitalization process uh, generates uh, risks at the system level. Uh, for the payment service providers, we have presented the indicators identified by the working group. Again, they refer, they have, uh, uh, they are at a more general level, such as low efficiency of uh, the reporting process. So um, they uh, are based on the findings of the inspections or audits conducted in this sector. Real estate agents are still at a mid-level uh, There was a question, why don't we have a medium to high uh, level for real estate agencies? Uh, well, because the transactions are uh, conducted via notaries and notaries have a medium to high risk. The real estate agents are promoters uh, uh, and of course they have uh, a medium level of risk and the gaps identified include uh, lack of staff uh, so uh, real estate agents do not have uh, funds enough uh, to afford to have a dedicated AML officer. So um, this process is somehow connected to other processes conducted by them um, or uh, the person uh, in charge of AML usually is an accountant or a lawyer, so they don't have a dedicated AML officer. And the risk level is medium because we have the possibility to intervene by the notaries. Let's do as follows. So we have uh, that table. So I suggest that when we are at the Q&A session to display it. And if someone would like to find out more details about a specific sector, then we will discuss it at the QA uh, session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for stopping me. I agree with you uh, because, it, yes, it's very important for you to tell me what uh, sectors you are more interested in. Well, I believe that out of what you have managed to say already, I believe that uh, many of questions uh, have been answered already, but by the um, information you've already presented, the financial sector is very much represented uh, in our community. And I believe that you have already mentioned uh, uh, a lot of relevant information for them. As for the other sectors, let's see if we have any specific questions for those sectors. Thank you very much, Mr. Adrian, Ms. Selena. Thank you. So let's continue with the third uh, panel speaker who will uh, come with a presentation. Michael is consultant in financial crime and compliance management uh, solutions uh, at Oracle. Michael, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn on my camera as well. Okay, hello everyone. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, session virtually. Uh, my last business meeting was in Chisnau, so I would have loved to have been there in person, if only for the nice food. But uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, virtually. So indeed, my name is Michael Fukaro. I'm based in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And I'm uh, what they call cons uh, solutions consultant. Um, why I'm saying that is because I just want to give you some insight of what I have experienced in the last you know, 10, 15 years. I've been in this, uh, in this area. I've worked in the uh, I live in the Netherlands, I worked here, I, I cover the European markets, as well as uh, a lot of experience in Brazil uh, and also in, uh, in Greece, where I lived there for a few years. So, you know, I've spoken to a myriad of different kinds of financial institutions. And based on that, there's, you know, there's a lot of findings that I'd like to share with you, uh, if you don't mind. So 
one thing I just want to point out, you know, we're all familiar with the, with the customer compliance lifecycle, right? There's, there's the onboarding, there is the, the due diligence, there is the, uh, you know, transaction monitoring that could be fraud, could be, uh, you know, the AML money laundering, and then the, the continuous monitoring, the risk assessment and feeding back into it. They are all, all independent, disparate um, systems, but the approach is it should be holistic. You know, these, these are, you know, what I find a lot of times is that with, with um, let's say for example, AML and KYC, they're all both risk-based. Um, it's not that you have a KYC score and then you have an AML event that's happened or a fraud event. All these systems should provide a holistic view and look at these as a financial crime incident, not necessarily as a specific siloed uh, KYC or siloed AML, but again, a, as a whole. So that's sort of the overlying uh, thoughts, but what I'd like to sort of walk you through here is, is basically a roadmap to address the challenges that I've seen many of, you know, of the financial institutions facing, some of the trends that, they, uh, that we've identified, and also sort of the roadmap of how you reach that. And this, this roadmap is irrelevant if you're a regional, global, tier one, uh, in whatever kind of financial uh, lines or business you're in. They all have the same underlying problems. Obviously, the skill might be different, but the approach is going to be the same. So let me just first talk about some of the challenges that I've seen. You know, and these are just, of course, very summation. Um, many organizations are coming across many different kinds of challenges. But one of the first things is the high cost. You know, as and that it's sort of embodied with the market trends. You know, things are going quicker. The regulators are requiring more information quicker. Uh, so that's going to cause a lot more resources, a lot more stress on resourcing. So what is ineffective, what really sort of like doesn't enhance the situation is having to deal with unproductive alerts, you know, false positives, as, as we now call them. Uh, having, as a result, you know, this trickles down into having inefficient investigations because you're spending too much time on, on, uh, on alerts or hits that are, are irrelevant. And then also that impacts the monetary effectiveness. You know, and all three of these translate into high costs. So that, that's, let's say, one side of the, of, the, of the challenges. The other side is the quick adaptation of changing regulatory behaviors and customer behaviors. Uh, you know, two really you know, realistic uh, or, or relevant points, of course, is the transaction, or rather the, the change of behavior of customers during COVID, you know, the, the change in, in uh, uh, transactional behavior, fraud schemes, et cetera. The other is, of course, reacting to uh, sanctions, you know, with, with, you know, with the unfortunate events that are going on right now in, uh, in Ukraine. Being able to modify and being able to address a, a, a robust system to be able to uh, be able to address these you know these new sanctions and being able to not leave the financial institution open for you know poor you know uh, reputational damage, uh, you know, having fines uh, and, and such. So these are sort of the underlying challenging. The market trends, and again, I'll, I'll talk about this uh, this route uh, shortly. But some of the market trends that I've seen uh, is, you know, collaboration. And I'm going to mean with collaboration is collaborations within financial institutions, providing a, a mechanism to have an overview. So not only just the financial institutions looking into the uh, uh, behavior within each bank, but looking at intrabanks. You know, it, it's easier said than said than done. You know, the FinCEN in the United States have have made some efforts to go towards this. Here in the Netherlands, uh, you know, recently uh, five banks have announced that they want to work closer together. Uh, it's, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, the, the, the broader the scope, the broader the view you have of behavior, the, the, the better, you know, the, the more complex behavioral patterns you can find. Um, so that's one thing that we're seeing. And that requires, of course, a system that's very uh, open, very transparent and supporting data models and, and, you know, that supports the entire information sharing. The second trend, and that actually this you'll find is permeated here, is advanced technologies. Uh, and these basically also help a lot with these challenges here in that introduction of things like graph analytics, using predictive models, you know, moving away from deterministic types of behavior detection that generates a lot of these false positives and causes lots of these cha challenges, but introducing these to help improve that. But that in itself has a lot of you know, uh, caveats as well. I'll talk about that shortly. Um, third point is cryptocurrency, as Natalia talked about uh, quite well about the, the introduction of cryptocurrencies and how to go about it. How do we monitor that? You know, that is something that all the regulators globally are, are scratching their heads on, how to best uh, do that. And then last thing that I pointed out here is the, the 
the regulations moving towards KYC strict, you know, re re requirements, specifically in the uh, unified uh, beneficiary, excuse me, beneficiary owner identification, the UBOs, which requires our understanding inside into corporate structures and then having that risk associated with that. So, you know, obviously market trends and, and requirements are continuously going to be moving. So as we go to the future, you know, it, it's, a, it's a moving target, right? So we're all trying to catch up in the most effective way of, of addressing these. So what I want to do right now is just sort of walk you through these. Uh, and again, this is a roadmap that is applicable to any financial institution. Again, it doesn't matter if it's a, it's a regional, global, it doesn't matter in which area in the world, they all struggle with the same uh, type of capabilities. So the first start is, you know, the basics of, of, of a behavior detection or rather a financial crime detection. And that is through logical and deterministic uh, detection, meaning there's rules, uh, parameters set up, be it for AML, understanding, okay, what do I consider a suspicious activity? What are suspicious transactions? What are the amounts? Is it high risk, et cetera? KYC, very similar. There's risk scores associated with, with, the, uh, uh, with, uh, with the risk of the individual. These are all very much deterministic. In itself, of course, that's what we call the unproductive alerts, because in its in the nature of, of deterministic is that it's in bed, if then, you know, it's going to be either hit those marks or it's not. There's no context to that. So again, that's going to cause a lot of false positive that trickles down to ineffective uh, investigations, ineffective monitoring, and then raising the cost. So what we try to do is, is, is use this as a basis, but move into how can we better uh, you know, better monitor and be more efficient. And it doesn't mean you have to rip and replace what you currently have. Uh, you know, it, it, this is a good foundation. The, the idea is to, to enhance that foundation or improve on that foundation without necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so this, this roadmap is designed to do that, to introduce new aspects that you can apply to your current situation and improve already the outcome. So one of these would be you know, the, the ability to have customization or flexibility in the rules, which most, you know, if not all systems are able to do that. Uh, introducing types of segmentation to what kind of typologies do I want to, how do I want to uh, address those? And lastly is this event correlation. So I, I want to mention events because uh, one of the things we've also seen and we currently embrace is moving away from calling things, you know, a, a hit or an alert, an alert, but moving away from that terminology and calling them events. And it's a very subtle change, but it's important in the sense that a, an alert, a hit, you sort of are required to investigate it. Whereas an event is something that has happened, can contribute to an overall behavior. And you're looking at it quite different. You're looking at more in context. So when we talk about event correlations, when you start looking at these results of the deterministic models, correlate them together based on you know typologies, based on certain focal points to create cases that are more comprehensive and reducing the, the workload. So even by applying, we're still talking about like deterministic systems, applying something like correlation, you're already reducing, let's say the, the workload by combining a lot of things together into an, a more easy overview. And that, that allows you to have more an effective monitoring and effective investigation because the analyst has a much more broader view on what they're seeing rather than just a very uh, small, snippet of information for the alert. So most organizations are here. You know, that is sort of the, the standard quo at this moment. And that, as we all know, again, that produces a lot of unproductive alerts and how are we going to improve that? So this is when we start introducing new technologies such as graph-based technology, uh, using things like um, um, uh, statistical modeling, uh, you know, robotic processing automation, pulling in data sources to enhance what you're, what you're seeing. So one of the primary one is, is uh, what we call graph analytics, basically allowing that to both be used in, in monitoring. So basically you're, you're creating scenarios based on networks, which can accomplish, uh, it can hold much more information than just the uh, um, deterministic uh, fields that you have. So what I mean with that is, for example, uh, we have a graph, then you have you know, your basic data set you could extend that data set to incorporate negative news information or you know, uh, corporate structures. You're pushing that data into your data model and you're seeing that now and you have much more a visualization of what are the risks involved by pushing in that external data points and that is all automatically done. So it helps the analyst by automatically in increasing the data set by incorporating 
external sources. So there's a lot of manual checks that an analyst might need to do. You know, an analyst would look at a case, would say, okay, are these individuals in the negative news? What is the corporate structure? If you're bringing that all in uh, directly and then presenting that to the analyst, you are very much improving their way of investigation and also being able to monitor in that way as well. So again, as we move forward and further, we, we start introducing things like modeling. And this is the machine learning, the artificial intelligence, uh, which in itself poses problems to the regulators in the sense that models are, very, are more difficult to explain. You know, these deterministic uh, rules are very straightforward. This is the parameter, this is what we're looking for. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the results are a lot of false positive, but it's very, very palatable. What are you trying to uh, uh, monitor? With models, of course, it becomes a little bit more, uh, not as transparent, right? So it's extremely important to have a very good governance behind that. I mean, that how am I going to prove to the regulators that the models are doing what they need to do? And not only that, it's for internally, it's important to understand, okay, what is the effectiveness of models? Um, you, know, be, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning are great terminologies, but it's not the magic bullet. It's not the one in itself going to solve all the problems. And not only that, AI and machine learning they need to be built. They're not like a model is out of the box, ready to be used. They need to be trained. They need to be trained on your data or the specific segment that you're looking at. So there is a lot of work involved and there's a lot of governance involved and management that's, that's involved, which is extremely important. So you just can't just apply a model and leave it as is. It's something that needs to be maintained and it needs to be challenged as you, as you, as you move forward. So, so in itself, it produces a lot of very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, productive alerts and, and, and events. Uh, in itself, there's, there is work behind that, right? So we, you know, we've in the market we've seen it specifically with, with this false positive management, and that can be done applied to any system. And just to, just an ex you know, example of, of my personal experience, you know, you know, I'm working for Oracle, and, and we have our own systems, of course, and, and we provide this layer. You know, we've worked with organizations that are using another system, you know, Tom Beller or you know, FICO or, or Actimize, et cetera. Uh, same, you know, same thing that the Oracle has, deterministic models that produce the results. But we're able to introduce a, a, a layer of, of, of um, deterministic modeling and event scoring that looks at these and scores them accordingly to help reduce those. So again, they're not, you know, it's not exclusive. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to rip and replace everything you have, but you can incorporate new technologies to you know, reach your specific end needs. And then again, that those are trying to address these challenges here. So these are, uh, uh, you know, supervised learning. And then at the furthest extreme right now, at the current situation is unsupervised learning. So this is basically using models and artificial intelligence to uh, basically replace these deterministic rule sets and run on its own to produce very high quality alerts. This is something that you know, not many organizations are doing yet, but there are a few that are actually starting out already. So I, I know personally of, of an organization that is uh, you know, using, of course, these deterministic models, and they're replicating uh, these, these models in predictive models to replace what's going on here. And you know, knowing full well that the regulators in that region is not ready to do that, but they're already starting to prepare themselves for the future because Moving forward, you know, we're going to see that this is going to be turned off. You know, it's not going to be short term, it'll probably be midterm, but the movement toward these models and using machine learning is going to be the way moving forward. Not only that, to also address things like cryptocurrency, the, the data sets required and, and identifying anomalies and such is going to be uh, that much more sophisticated than what we see here. And that also relates back to the, uh, the adaptation of, of changing regulations. Instead of like looking for specific types of typologies, we're looking at anomalies. And anomalies are easier to find in, in modeling than rather uh, just deterministic uh, models. So this also goes back to uh, what Adrian before me spoke about, that the cost of, uh, of compliance shouldn't be considered as an overhead. Because, you know, obviously, Looking at the black and white, it is overhead in the sense that we're, we're, we're spending money and trying to prevent additional money coming into the bank or leaving the bank. But the reputational uh, damage associated with that uh, is, is far greater, as Adrian has also pointed out, far greater than the cost that you would be making to do this, to have a mature uh, uh, you know, 
compliance department to really look at and be proactive in finding the uh, uh, you know the suspicious activity. And again, regulatory pressure is going to be continuously, it's going to be more and more apparent as we move forward. So having a good foundation already st starting to look forward is going to be extremely uh, important in, uh, to be able to address any of the future needs. Um, so just quickly, um, before I close up, I just, sort of, just want to point out again that you know, using technologies, new technologies such as graph analytics will help uh, in that pathway to, uh, to being much more comprehensive and being much more flexible and robust in your, uh, in your monitoring. And that's all I want to say at this moment. Uh, I'm sure, again, I know we have a question and answers afterwards, so uh, I'll leave it for that. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Michael, uh, very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we will move to our next panelist. Yuzhval, uh, he is a director of channel sales uh, at uh, Zanzi. Yuzhval, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, first of all, I'd like to start off this by saying it's been an honor to be a part of this conference and just listening to some of our previous speakers talk about the technological transformation landscape as a whole is extremely interesting and um, hopefully we can continue um, with that same sense with um, my presentation. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen and perfect. Um, so typically what I see when I talk about SignZ in general is I always go back to a personal story that I had experienced well before I even joined SignZ. And what I've just come to understand is um, this experience translates very significantly to where the current um, financial institute, financial landscape is in terms of digital technology. So the story begins in February of 2020 where I had just decided to um, switch my banking partner because I was completely done with my um, previous bank. And while I started doing research about potential banks to join, I quickly found a, an amazing offer by the biggest bank in the world where they were offering a $500 welcome bonus if you join them in the next two or three weeks. And all I had to do was simply download their mobile app and get approved for an account in no more than five minutes. So without much thinking, immediately downloaded the app, gathered all my identity documents and went through the entire journey in less than five minutes and click submit. And as I'm sure you're already aware, um, what transpired over the next few weeks um, really shifted my attention from my bank to everything that was going on because of um, the coronavirus outbreak. And you know that excitement of having a new banking partner was quickly substituted with, you know, everything shutting down, whether it be banks, schools, universities, hospitals, and everything. And this happened for the next few months, where eventually, in the middle of June, I got an email from the bank saying that we were unable to verify and approve your application. Please come into a bank branch to complete your verification. At this point, I had completely forgotten that I'd even signed up for this account and was extremely um, afraid to go into the bank branch. So I gave it a couple of weeks and eventually um, got the courage to go into the bank and complete the process. You know, once I got to the branch, um, I was forced to redo the entire application and get approved. And as I was walking out, I wanted to simply ask the branch manager as to why my first um, application got rejected. And what he said was the picture of my driver's license that I had submitted in my application was too blurry for the um, KYC teams to review. And because of that, I wasted almost four and a half months of potential banking with this um, with this uh, financial institute. And that really highlights the overall problem that SignZ is trying to currently solve with digital onboarding. Um, 
Yeah. And, you know, when the company was founded, it was founded with the specific idea of helping people like me have digital channels of getting into financial institutes like banks, um, investment firms and things like that. And um, what we see is the need for providing digital verification services goes well beyond just banks. As you can see here on our screen, we work with payment facilitators, other fintechs, um, and also logistics companies. And, and basically the overall business transformation efforts that are going in to where Science is currently operating is what we're seeing at a global level is banks investing billions of euros into digital products to simply bring the bank itself to the customer rather than have the customers such as myself back in February come and visit the branch. Now, um, there are multiple different ways that banks are going about solving this. Um, the more most popular ones obviously being um, your mobile apps and also online banking um, tools. Also something that's becoming more and more popular is um, advertising financial products and also providing customer service through social media channels. And also in extremely recent times, we're seeing virtual reality becoming more and more important and is actually one of the reasons why Sciency has um, gotten a patent within the metaverse to um, be on the forefront of changes in the digital transformation landscape. Um, all of this in retrospect is good news for customers such as us. Um, but if you aren't able to provide you know, digital channels to bring in and verify new customers, then all those investments you made into your social media, mobile apps, online banking is almost for waste, for no reason, because you begin that, um, you begin that relationship with your customer in a bad way. And it goes back to the saying, um, you only have one chance to make a first impression. And that's where SignZ is currently trying to put all its efforts into, you know, if a bank in today's time would like to, you know, build these digital solutions themselves in house. What they see extremely quickly is the fact that this project, which they would assume to be a very quick one, actually turns out to be a gigantic process as a whole um, for multiple different reasons. I think the first being, and very clearly, the number of um, technology vendors that you would have to bring in to complete these journeys. Um, typically what we've seen from our case studies is it would take around eight to 10 different vendors at the minimum to build out these um, onboarding journeys. And then once you've actually identified and assessed and contracted with these vendors, then you would have to actually build out these apps and tools and integrate all these different players and make sure everything works smoothly at once. Now, all of this simply translates to um, a lack of scalability into providing um, these journeys for different products. And also if you've realized that there's been, you would require to make a change in your onboarding solution, it would be almost weeks and weeks of um, downtime to make these modifications. Now, um, what SignZ provides and how we attempt to solve this problem is what we have done is we have built out a, a digital no-code workflow builder, which basically means that with SignZ, all we have to do is simply drag and drop um, specific verification tools, pages in a matter of minutes that banks can start leveraging in almost no time. Um, to be more specific with the product and solution we have at SignZ, we are able to build custom and unique pages and verification tools and then stitch them all together into workflows that are designed for your requirements and per your KYC regulations. 
and provide all of that in an easy to digest manner, not only for the applicant, but also for the bank itself by providing a back office dashboard, which the bank's KYC teams can constantly review and approve. Um, we're able to provide all of these services in a matter of almost two months by doing a lot of the grunt work or the busy heavy lifting that we saw on the previous page of pre-integrating all those vendors that you saw on the previous screen into our solution. So when it comes to providing um, a journey for a bank in Costa Rica who are trying to build a digital onboarding product for credit cards, we would be able to build that in a matter of weeks and deploy it in a matter of weeks again. And then that same bank can then reach back out to us and ask us to then build a, a loan verification or a loan origination journey for a branch they have in another country. So that pre-integration um, pre of these services plays a heavy part into you know, providing that seamless and seamless experience for banks. But to talk about the services that we're able to provide for the customers, um, Science Yield so has built in-house AI verification tools that help make that process of um, that application turnaround time, meaning the approval time it takes for an applicant in a matter of minutes by simply adding AI tools on top of the journeys we built. So by leveraging artificial intelligence, we have been able to help our customers get approved and onboarded onto a bank systems in anywhere between one to five minutes. And you know, when you compare that time to the time it took me to um, get banking with my current bank, which is almost four and a half months, that's a very significant difference, which costs millions and millions of um, unearned money for banks specifically. And basically when Sciency were figuring out how to go about solving these um, problems, we kept um, configuration, configurability, and that ability to be flexible with changes at the forefront of everything. And because of that, you know, we have been able to solve use cases that we would have never dreamt of when we first joined, uh, started our company. Great examples of this would be when we helped the government of India with um, a project that um, they had just um, launched. And basically to give you a little bit of context, um, the government of India made a new regulation in the banking space to actually mask or redact um, Indian citizens' um, unique identification numbers in order to be compliant and also in case of um, data um, uh, hacks and um, data, um, data loss, um, sensitive and personal information doesn't get leaked to, um, to customers. And basically because of this, um, almost overnight change in regulation, a lot of our banks and financial institute customers in India were automatically non-compliant with these rules. And what Sainzi was able to do in a matter of 72 hours was able to develop a custom solution that all our banking, um, banking customers could use and become compliant again. That idea of configurability also goes heavily into you know, the actual product that we sell. As I previously alluded to, the product is able to scale at a geographical level and also at a use case level. So if a bank wants to solve credit card onboarding in one country and then the next day want to solve um, business entity onboarding the next day in a completely different country, Sciency is able to um, undertake these tasks um, because of the solution as a whole. And a great example of this is when we um, contracted with Lulu Money Exchange, which is a, a remittance company with operations in, uh, in mostly in um, Asia Pacific region. And when they came to us, they had a problem that when their customers wanted to send money from one country to another, 
the entire verification process that they had to do was completely physical, meaning that the customer would have to go to a branch with their driver's license or identification document, give it to a bank teller to verify, and then also required the recipient of the money to get verified at the branch as well. So what Signsy was able to do was we were able to build five different um, workflows for five different countries all at once to allow Lulu Money to um, Lulu Money customers to simply do that verification well before um, the sending of money and make that whole journey extremely easy and comfortable for them. Um, similarly, we've also worked with multiple initiatives with the Reserve Bank of India, which is the federal um, the federal banking agency of India, where um, we've helped introduce multiple legislations within the Indian banking space, the most popular being um, Video KYC, where because of the efficiency of our tool to verify customers by simply taking a video of themselves, um, RBI actually then made it um, a mandatory verification or due diligence check that all financial institutes in India would have to um, adhere to. Um, finally, um, just wanted to quickly talk about a few different use cases that might be extremely relevant to today's call. Um, you know, as I said before, we've um, worked with not only banks, but also digital and fintech companies. Um, a great example of this would be um, MSwipe, which is a MasterCard product that provides um, POS services to merchants. And again, the use case here was um, MSwipe was struggling to verify merchants um, in a timely manner. And because of that, they were actually losing customers. Um, that's where Signsy came in. We helped build um, multiple different merchant solutions for MSwipe that they started leveraging immediately. And as you can see in the bottom, some of the results from that. Um, State Bank of India as well, one of the, the biggest bank in India and um, public, um, public bank. Um, the same issue, but for individual customers rather than business entities like the previous one. Um, very similar use case and problem statement that we were able to solve using the ones, the same solution that we have, Sizey. And I just want to quickly um, wrap this conversation up by talking about some of the pre-integrations that Signsy currently has. And this is how we're able to help banks, regulatory bodies, and financial institutes as a whole scale as they grow, um, scale their due diligence and KYC practices along with the bank. Um, as you can see here, it, the verification tools are a mixture of individual verification or eKYC tools but also business entity verification tools. Um, we also come pre-integrated with our AI built services that are designed to provide customers with an extremely efficient um, onboarding journey where by simply taking a picture of your driver's license, almost 90% of your application is done by taking that one simple picture. And um, that's it, um, I hope I, um, didn't quick, go too quickly through this presentation and, you know, happy to um, answer any questions if there may be. Wow, we will come back with our questions later. Now I would like to introduce uh, Diana, personal data protection, uh, ethics and compliance from Moldsell. Uh, Diana, I have a very complex mission and the time left, you need to manage to make your presentation and so that we can start a question and answer session. Well, I will try to. Good afternoon, everyone who is um, here in the room and to all the ones who are online. I see that I admire your patience for staying with us so long. I hope uh, you'll you will find yourself in a presentation that I will share on the screen now because I will try to talk about the biggest challenges or the biggest constraints that we encounter in the business environment because you should know I really like 
so much this uh, forum for debating ideas and topics, both in terms of digital transformation and financial inclusion, but also we cannot skip topics related to data privacy and cybersecurity, especially uh, since this uh, digitalization trend creates a very large data set of amazingly big data set and in this data set 90% uh, are private data, personal data and then we need to resume, we need to uh, recap on some challenges that we face in our day-to-day -day activity and I will try to see if, cha if slides change just to make sure that you can also see them. So I tried to analyze generally, not only from the perspective of the company I represent, but I tried to analyze generally the business environment. What are the biggest challenges? And you should know that the main challenge, and everyone will agree with me, I think, is the gap related to personal data protection gap. You know, uh, even now we have this trend of collecting as many data as possible, thinking that, oh, well, maybe I will need them after some time. At the same time, we also have this uh, low level of awareness among citizens when they offer their personal data everywhere without having any critical thinking behind it, you know. we also have this uh, trend, probably it comes from Soviet times, when you think that if I have more data, it will be better. But you should know it's not always right, because this means uh, high exposure to risks, and uh, I mean both compliance, legal compliance risks related to personal data protection, but also uh, data theft or data breach situations or even consumption of resources. So for, the, for this, it would be good to have a magical solution so that we can balance between the need to collect and process and store data in large amounts, but also to highlight uh, and emphasize the compliance requirements so that we can turn this into an opportunity as Adriano was saying, often data protection is treated as, a, as an obstruction, but you should know that several companies prove that this can be used as a competitive advantage when you raise the trust of your clients, raise of data subjects, when they know that this company processes data in the right way and ensures data security. Another challenge is embedding the data privacy. And you should know that in many companies, I don't know why, data protection is treated mostly as an IT thing uh, because they, it has relation to um, the IT security or it's related to disaster recovery plan. But actually, data protection brings together a lot of subject, if I may say, a very broad area, and it would be good to be for it to be integrated in all processes in the company. At the same time, another constraint uh, rep is represented by the cost. How can we stay without the budgets that are always very large, especially when we talk about uh, ensuring the security of data, preventing uh, the risks that all of that means significant costs, but looking at it from the other side, the risk of a security breach or data leak is much more significant and that's why we should make the appropriate investments. A constraint that we have seen often in many companies is about access to this data. But here I would like to make a connection uh, with uh, awareness of data protection. Often uh, the companies uh, 
could uh, have situations when employees could be the weak uh, chain because of incorrect awareness uh, of access to this data um, and when the control of uh, the access data is weak last but not least it seems that what is the connection between businesses and control authorities but uh, the lack of resources uh, uh, in the authority impacts uh, the companies, both individuals and data operators, because we data operators also need guidance uh, by the authorities, because when we speak about uh, the connection between the supervisory authority, data uh, subjects, data um, operators, we need to have synergy. At the same time, we have, uh, 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 on the basis of the latest legal amendments, there is uh, an obligation to have a data protection officer or uh, it is also known as DPO. So you can see on the screen a very representative image when the main responsibility of the DPO is to successfully balance, on the one hand, the company's alignment with the security requirements, data protection requirements. At the same time, there is a need to ensure and to secure the company's uh, and client's trust, uh, to secure the implementation of business strategies. So this is quite a complicated challenge. At the same time, analyzing not only at the level of our country, but at the international level, if we are to analyze the community of DPOs, we can see many constraints or many challenges uh, that they encounter. And one of them would be the practical applicability of those tools. An interesting issue is the fact that usually a DPO knows what they have to do. They, need, they know what mechanism they have to implement. But again, uh, this implies costs. Uh, money that is needed for the technical implementation, especially if uh, uh, we make a connection with process digitalization. If processes are digitalized, the data set increases. So it's very difficult to have an overview of the whole situation so that all of the activities can be managed properly, activities that involve data processing. But this is the core activity of a DPO. Also, we should not forget that we have uh, uh, insufficient uh, case law in, in Moldova, especially in Moldova, where this area is quite, no, quite new. But this is true also about the European Union level. We still have, uh, we still feel uh, the insufficient interpretation of legal requirements so that we can take a correct decision and implement it properly in the daily work. Everybody, especially in our country, as a result of the pandemic, felt the insufficiency or better said, crisis of talents. Because you have to know the situation is even worse in the area of data protection, because there are very few people that have knowledge that could help correctly and quickly to implement all of these requirements. That is why we still have a lot of things to improve in this area. And last but not least, the duty of a DPO is to cooperate with other organizational units. So DPO needs an active support for that. But again, if I am to connect with the insufficient culture at the level of company, culture in the area of data protection, and this uh, deficiency, this insufficiency is very much felt because a DPO cannot do all of the activities in a company because each department, each unit is processing personal data. 
So there is a need to have a cooperation with each separate department to check the processes, to check the um, uh, activities and processes that use data, what is the goal, and so on, in order to ensure compliance with the legal requirements. Uh, regarding data protection, uh, I would like to underline one more time uh, that in the digital area, confidentiality is a priority. Mold cell company that I represent besides data protection, as I said earlier, which is not an impediment to develop other solutions, other novelty products, so that we are aligned to the global trends. So that is why we are speaking about digitalization, about a digital country, and Maltzell is contributing to achieving this goal, being an operator that is integrating the data flow between the public sector, private sector, and citizens. I would like to make a very quick uh, overview of the innovative solutions that we developed in 2021. And here I would focus on eSIM, which is an innovative technology. We are the first and the only ones that brought on the market a solution that is a SIM integrated in a smartphone, which besides being uh, environmentally friendly is also useful because you can use all of the advantages of the smartphone without having a plastic another platform that i will present very briefly and quickly is the mdoc service it revolutionized uh, on the mobile telephony market especially when it comes to the interaction on the business platform it allows exchange of documents, of agreements, only on the basis of a mobile signature. So uh, business operators do not, are not dependent on the shops, for example, to travel to the shop physically in order to get the signature. Uh, well, we have not thought, we have not forgot about internal um, uh, customers. We have implemented innovative platforms for employees uh, that have various tutorial and uh, professional development platforms. I also have to mention the e-contract service. This is an exclusive solution on the market. Customers can sign the digital contract, which is an echo version of a traditional agreement all these innovations bring it in line with the sustainable development objectives of the United Nations, uh, to which we are a party since 2020. So as long as we speak about financial inclusion, I would like to make a public announcement here. Maltzell is already part of FinTech when we received uh, the license for e-money signed by the National Bank of Moldova. So we are a company issuing electronic money. So our customers will already have the Maltzell wallet, which can be used for financial transactions. And now, very briefly, I would like to make a conclusion covering all of the services that we provide. So besides this broad and impressive portfolio of digital solutions, it is based on the digitally human concept. What does it mean? Well, all of us are used with the robotization or digitalization, especially during the pandemic, when we felt this... Uh, lack or insufficiency of human interaction. That is why we focused on human, on human approach when we interact with each and every customer of ours. Moreover, the products that were developed by Maltzell are based on people, on our employees, on the needs, wishes 
aspirations of our employees to implement the ideas so that we have and are able to provide innovative products and services to you. That is why we think that uh, our people are the core asset of our company that we are very proud of. So, if we are to make a brief uh, review of all of the developments of last year, we can proudly say that we have changed, we have improved uh, for the lives of Moldovan people and we know that the impact that we had was possible thanks to our customers and also thanks to our employees because thanks to that digitally human concept we can be positive that everything can be implemented in the future thank you very much i try to be brief in order not to exceed the time Thank you, we appreciate very much. Though we have exceeded the time, I nevertheless don't want to leave without questions and answers. We have a very interesting question and the other questions will be collected by the organizers and those uh, uh, who are watching online, uh, they'll have the chance to send the questions and then they'll get the answers. And for those who are present physically here, we'll have a networking session. Mr. Adrian, the question is to you. It's about the risk assessment in the insurance sector. The risk assessment report is reviewed in time. And the question is about the dynamics. Do we have any improvements in this sector or the trend is negative? And the risk generated companies on this market that were identified with non-compliances, are they monitored for compliance? And what tools, what instruments are available and are implemented in such cases? Thank you very much for your question. That's a great question because the answer will bring clarity. I will start with the last part of the question. Risk assessment uh, aims at establishing at the country level the areas or sectors where we have to allocate more resources because we, the authority, have limited resources. Our resources are scarce and the risk assessment helps us understand where we have to invest our resources. The fact that uh, the risk level is assessed at the medium to high uh, level, it does not mean that the companies there will be monitored and evaluated well, they will be, but not as a result of the risk assessment. Or for example, the service, supervisory authorities, or other authorities that are involved in this process will need that they will have to allocate the needed resources. For example, if a sector has a low or risk level, then they will have to allocate fewer resources because you have to focus your resources on areas that have a high or medium to high risk level. So that is why, according to the standard, we have to update periodically the risk so that we know the current situation. Because the situation is evolving, is changing, the legal framework is changing as well, the tools are changing. That is why it is of critical importance for this risk assessment to be conducted on a periodical basis so that authorities can apply appropriate uh, measures depending on uh, the risk level. Of course, it does not mean that a certain sector has a high risk or medium to high risk. All the companies in that sector will be monitored. No, no, no. Uh, this means that we have to plan certain activities for the whole sector. Regarding the insurance sector, the assessment was done on the basis of the practice accumulated by the supervisor. The uh, leader of the evaluation group was the National Commission for Financial Markets. And on the basis of the ex experience they accumulated since the previous evaluation, they have assessed the risk level at medium. It does not mean that the companies that have uh, drawbacks uh, uh, or deficiencies will uh, be subjected to certain uh, interventions or monitoring. Well, they might be monitored, 
but because of other factors, as a result of other developments, not because of the risk level assigned in the risk assessment report. So that is why this risk assessment report changed the concept of uh, preventing and finding money laundering and terrorist financing. It was introduced in the law since 2018, and it requires a change in the attitude of reporting entities. As I've said, because the reporting entities have many transactions, some of them have hundreds of thousands and even more, so they cannot physically check all of the transactions. That's why they need to have an algorithm, and the solutions implemented have to be implemented according to some scenarios, and they have to focus on anomalies identified, something that is not in line with a normal behavior or a normal trend. So, as I've said, the risk assessment allows to allocate invest resources in the most problematic areas. For example, if a, a supervisor comes and asks you, why haven't you uh, taken any measures in this area? And if you have a risk assessment and if you have a software generating these risk scenarios or can generate some red flags, you can show that that specific area was not identified as a risky one. So the reporting entity is helped uh, to identify the areas that are subjected to higher risks that needs to be analyzed in more details. That's why I wanted to underline that the risk assessment is helpful to all of us for us to understand where to allocate our resources. At the next step, the sector assessment report and then the risk assessment report at the entity level will help um, allocate resources at those levels. Thank you very much for your answer.